So can you talk about um, what your style says about you? I had model parents my whole life, and so I grew up in the industry of everyone being beautiful and a world that just doesn't exist, it's not reality. But I was always just lost in kind of being that cool girl or that pretty girl or that whatever it, it was, and I didn't have a problem getting in anywhere, I didn't have a problem getting out of tickets or... I used it, it was my, my go-to, and then when this happened, you know, it was something physical that I couldn't hide. I was that girl that you wanted, but you couldn't get. I ran away from love. I ran away from anything that was substance. You know, being seen and next to so-and-so, who cares? You know, but that, but that actually matters to some people. That actually, you know, to them is their value right. because they don't value themselves. So that right. person is validating their worth because they're somebody. Unless something really tragic happens or something that you have to confront head on, I don't think that you'll change, really. I think it's just something you'll just keep tossing away and keep, you know, pushing aside. Can you explain what happened to you? <laughs> and in, like, from the beginning? It was 2012. Um, I was 24 years old. And um, it was a normal day in my life. Uh, I was on my period. I ran out of my go-tos, ran downstairs. Um, picked up a couple things, got some tampons, went back up. I changed my tampon. I laid in my bed. I was texting with my girlfriends. I started feeling kind of shitty. It was my friend's birthday, and I was texting with them, and deciding if I was even going to be able to make it because I just started feeling worse and worse as the day went on. Just flu-like symptoms, just like starting to feel like nauseous and my head pounding. And as soon as I walked inside, literally all of my friends looked at me and said, "Dude, you look really horrible." Like, you need to go home. I drove myself back to my apartment, and all I wanted to do was get into my bed. The next thing I remember is my blind Cocker Spaniel um, barking ferociously on my chest. Shook my head a little bit, and I like, came to, and I could just hear pounding at the door, and there was police, police open up. And I was just like, why are the police here? I was so confused. And it was one officer, and he came inside, and um, there was dog pee and poo everywhere because I hadn't been able to take my dog out. I didn't even know what time it was. I had no idea what was going on. He looked around my apartment and he looked at me and he said, uh, you're really sick. And I said, okay. And he said, you really need to call your mom because she's really worried about you. I carried myself back to my bed. I plugged in my cell phone, uh, charged a little bit enough to call my mom. She was frantic. She said, you know, are you okay? Do you need an ambulance? And I was like, I'm just really sick. I just want to sleep. And obviously the cop had just left. So she felt comfortable with, you know, saying, I'll see you in the morning. I guess my mom never heard from me. Called for another welfare check called for all of my girlfriends to go to my apartment, um, was actually on her way from Riverside, and was called the police. Um, they got to my apartment. It took them like 30 minutes to get inside. They found me on my bedroom floor, face down. I had 107 fever. All my kidneys were failing. And I had a heart attack. Um, thank God there was an infectious disease doctor there because as soon as they saw me, I was plummeting so bad that they didn't understand why this young, healthy 24-year-old girl was dying and there was nothing I was being receptive to so they couldn't figure it out and they called the specialist down and he said well does she have a tampon in and once they located that I had a tampon and they took it out they sent it to the lab and it came back as TSS1 toxic shock syndrome and as soon as they removed it I started becoming more susceptible to the medicine and the antibiotics you know they could put me in a, in, in a medically induced coma and life support and that could stabilize me for the time being they were telling my mom and my godfather that I should prepare my funeral and that there's no way that you know, I'm gonna walk out of there. That it would be a miracle. So, but it was you started feeling symptoms right away with the first tampon, right? Yeah. It wasn't like when you were sleeping that that it was. Yeah. I was completely, I was completely like, it was just a normal day. I didn't think anything different. I had been using the same brand for 11 years. So I was in a medically induced coma for a week and a half. Um, then I told you they had to pump me full of 80 pounds of fluid to get all the toxins out of my body. Countless blood transfusions. I just remember like waking up and being like, I couldn't see my vagina. So I was like, this is crazy. Like, why am I so huge? My feet were just excruciating. They were just on fire and like literally felt like they were just being burned. As I was actually there, I was by myself. My mom had just stepped out. My godfather had just left. So I was completely alone. And there was a curtain there and there was a nurse. And I remember her speaking to someone from UCLA saying, I have a 24-year-old girl here who's gonna need a, a right leg below the knee amputation. And as soon as I that heard- That was the first time you heard that? Yeah. 
and I was by myself and I knew my legs were not good, but I just couldn't. Hearing those words out of her mouth and like being by myself, it was like so surreal. That was really heavy. It was already like surreal enough to like wake up in that state and knowing that it was obviously that severe to hear that, you know, I'm an athlete, I'm 24 years old, I'm just a girl, you know, I had my whole life. My legs were my life. I didn't want it to be true, I just, I just kept crying and screaming and wanting my mom and please mom, like, don't let them take my leg, you know, please don't, don't let that happen. But I don't think there's anything you could really do in that situation other than try and be strong. I wouldn't look at my legs. I had um, these boots on, white little boots that like I just kept over my feet to protect them, but also so I didn't have to look at them because they were black, they were gangrene, they were dead, they were, they weren't coming back. You know, and then I had, you know, prosthetic people coming in and showing me suitcases full of legs and I had amputees meeting me and showing me what my new life is gonna be like. You know, they told me what my options was, so, you know, I had to sign the papers for my right leg to go, which is fucking crazy, because I didn't even, don't think you could even process what you're signing at that moment. When they call your name to go in there to, like, do it is, my, I mean, my mom, God bless her, it was so hard. Tissue. We'll get you a tissue. She slept there, she, everything. Never left my side. You know, my mom kissing my leg. And they write like, yes and no on your legs. Like, yes, this is the one that's going. And no, this is the one that we're keeping. And to see that visually on your leg. And then my mom kissing my leg and knowing that that's the last time. It was crazy. During the procedure of my amputation, um, my body and my heart freaked out. So as soon as I came to, they wouldn't give me pain medicine for 24 hours. So immediately I woke up from the amputation and I felt every single thing that happened for 24 hours. Screaming my head off, throwing shit. I mean, it was fucking hell. I was miserable. I, I hated everyone, I hated everything, I hated myself. I feel so bad for my mom because she was my punching bag in those moments, in that time in my life, because I just did not want to live. What the hell do I do from here? Where did I go? Where's my like freedom? Where's my independence? My little brother um, was 14 at the time and he was coming home every day from school. As much as I wanted to give in and, and kill myself and end the misery that I was you know, dealing with every moment of every day, knowing that he would come home and be the one to find me and live his, you know, the rest of his life knowing that I'd given up and I took the easy way out or, or whatever he may have thought. I didn't want him living with that, that that wasn't the last thing that he saw of me in those moments. So going back to me being superficial and a jerk in my previous life um, and being in the club and being that girl, uh, my girlfriend now, she'd be in the club around that time too and would try to photograph me and I would be a complete dick to her and just be like, you know, no, like I don't want you to take my picture and like just be a jerk for no reason. It's literally as soon as I woke up from that coma, I was a completely different person. Literally, like, wow, it was crazy. And I immediately wanted to apologize to everybody that I had done wrong or, you know, had been rude to or whatever it may have been. I just wanted to make peace. So I reached out to her and I was like, I'm, you know, so sorry, blah, blah, blah. Cut to, I'm in my apartment, miserable. She texted me or Facebooked me out of nowhere and she had said like, hey, I'm going to movies with my kids, would love if you'd come. And literally at that, mo at that moment, I lied to her. And I said, I'm in New York actually modeling right now, I can't. But really I was in my bed just trying to learn how to walk again. Judgment. I was so afraid judgment. of, it wasn't even judgment, it was rejection. 
It was the one thing that I had never had to deal with in my entire life. Am I ugly? Am I disgusting? Am I, I'm ashamed of who I am. I'm no longer beautiful. I'm no longer that, that hot supermodel ask whatever you want to, you know, I'm not that girl anymore. What am I? We kept talking and, and we actually fell in love over the phone, even though we had met each other. But So I used her as my motivation to make sure that I could walk to her front door and I could stand up and I could, you know, with pants on, her seeing me as a human being and not as someone who's just gone through something, but just, I'm Lauren Wasser, you know, like, I'm, it's mm -hmm. me. I remember just walking up to her door and I opened the door, she Wait, opened the door. Uh, Wait, sorry. Were you really nervous, like, to walk oh, up to her door? Because you knew she was going to find out, obviously. I... Or did you not? I didn't, I didn't care what okay. she said to me. It was the fact that I knew to get to, to that point what I had to do for myself. Mm -hmm. You were ready. I was ready. I knocked on her door, and she opened the door, and I walked in fine. And I just said, I need to tell you something. And she was like, okay. And, and then I told her, and I showed her my leg, and she's like, I don't fucking care. It was so, like... <sighs> tampon companies have done a very good job of kind of making it seem as though everything's okay. You see tampon commercials and you see, you know, girls running on a beach or going down a slide and it's like there's no warning at the bottom of that at all about TSS or, you know, you could lose limbs or you could fucking die. It can happen within five minutes of using one. It could be your first tampon you ever use in your life. And I realized that I had a purpose. And then we got in links with this uh, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney here in New York City. Um, she's gone in front of Congress nine, ten times trying to pass this bill called the Robin Danielson Act. It was after a woman who died in 1988 from toxic shock syndrome. And it's basically just, uh, just a, a bill to, as women to have more info on what's going in these products and what are the long-term effects it has on our bodies using them for as long as we do. There's more, you know, research done on coffee filters than women's hygiene. I've been modeling again, and my first job actually back was with Nordstrom. They actually gave my my gold leg its own page, which is really cool, because I didn't I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know, you know, how are they going to treat me. Are they going to treat me like a regular model? But I got there and it was just like, everyone was amazing and I felt like a million bucks. Would you ever trade? It's hard because there's a part of me that's, I wake up and I wish I could go outside and fucking run a marathon. So that mentally fucks with me on a daily basis. I can't think about what I had because me doing that is just going backwards. I'm trying to move forward. My heart wouldn't be full. I wouldn't feel like I'm doing good. I wouldn't feel like I'm making an impact in a positive way. I wouldn't have known what that felt like because I didn't do that before. Mm -hmm. So, I don't think I would. Well, thank you so much. That was just the most <laughs> unbelievably beautiful thank you. gift that you just gave. Thank you so much for watching our video and for being such an incredible supporter of Style Like You. We're Elisa and Lily, a mother and daughter on a mission to inspire acceptance by revealing what's underneath personal style. Through radically honest docu-style videos, we are leading the fashion and beauty industries towards self-love, diversity, and inclusion. Join our movement by following us on Instagram, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and buying our new book today.